What comes to your mind when you hear the word helicopter? A large or medium transport, a small or even a tiny jolly machine. Sometimes it is something military, noisy and intimidating. All the helicopters are different and vary in design, missions and capabilities. But what if you need something more versatile? I want my machine to be agile and fast as a light transport, while being large, comfortable and techy like a serious business jet. And of course, it's got to be a helicopter. Perhaps this is all too much for a single machine. Let's see. Hello aviators, Sky here and today we are at the Gorka heliport west of Moscow. It is meant for business aviation and helicopters of different classes. Hence, you'll find here all that's needed for the rotary wing aircraft without forgetting about the comfort of their owners. Inside the hangar, the SkyPro helicopter's operator has some quite interesting machines, including our today's hero. Behold, the helicopter that is meant to satisfy all of our demanding requests. The passion and pride of the renowned Italian Leonardo Consortium, the model 139. So, the Leonardo AW139 is a mid-sized multi-role helicopter developed in the beginning of the 2000s. It is one of the outstanding cases when the engineers decided to create something awesome, and they succeeded. AW stands for Augusta Westland. It is the old name of the helicopter company, known today as Leonardo Helicopters. This name is not used anymore, but the index did remain in the name of the chopper, for now. The story of this beauty dates back to a problem in the 1990s. The fleets of many countries were full of different helicopters, all of which had their own merits of course, but they were rapidly getting obsolete. The Italian aviators were among the first ones to experience this problem. Back then, they were busy with licensed manufacturing of different modifications of the UH-1, the famous Huey, and were increasingly feeling the need to replace it. Yet another problem was the versatility. Creating a highly specialized helicopter would be risky and unprofitable, and they didn't have the resources to develop an entire family of different models. There was only one solution – create a new, highly efficient helicopter with the sights for broad markets. Consequently, it should be able to complete a wide variety of missions. In 1997, it was decided to make such a helicopter. The main activity of the company back then consisted of the licensed production of helicopters and they were additionally manufacturing a couple of models of their own. The light A109 and the combat A129 Mangusta. In addition to that, jointly with the British Westland, the Italians were producing the rather large military transport helicopter EH-101. But the creation of a completely new helicopter requires tons of new technologies and a huge pile of cash. New partners were needed, and the dances with foreign companies began. The longtime colleagues from the other side of the pond came in handy, since they were also in search for new partners to materialize their ideas. In 1998, Augusta and Bell formed the joint Bell Augusta Aircraft Company, or simply BAAC, which was meant to turn into reality two ambitious projects – the cutting-edge AB-139 helicopter and the BA-609 tilt-rotor VTOL the first civilian representative of this breed. The Italians needed a new and advanced helicopter, but they weren't going to jump over their heads. The configuration was quite classic, with the main and tail rotor, a tricycle landing gear, a white glazing in the cockpit and a cabin, closed by doors on both sides. By the way, this helicopter is quite deceitful dimension-wise. At first glance it does not seem to be all that big, but with a closer look it turns out to be considerably larger. The overall length of this machine is 16.66 meters, while the height reaches the mark of 4.98 meters. The exterior design puts in evidence the genetics of this helicopter. It looks like its siblings created by both companies. The first serial machines were even more similar, while the modifications made over the years have enhanced its individuality. Compared to its relatives, the appearance of 139 takes the middle position in terms of brutality. For instance, the smaller AW109 and 119 are classic light helicopters, with a refined design and outlines, just like sports cars. At the same time, the European military choppers, especially the EH101, which later became the AW101, are on the other side of the spectrum, with a harsher design and more angular airframes, meant for more aggressive operational conditions. The 139 took in a mix of completely new technological solutions and those that have been proven on other helicopters. This is why it combines the style and toughness. Of course this chopper is not bulletproof, but at the same time it is not as delicate as some of its colleagues. 
A design like that, coupled with the right balance between metals and composites, allows to achieve great flight performance and the capacity to work in quite harsh conditions. This brings up a question. What for? The aviators needed to reach the farthest corners of the market, hence their brainchild was designed to be a master of all trades. There are medical and rescue versions, those meant to work with energy infrastructure. There are even versions for the security services, the police and the military. This means that it must feel at home, whether it's hot or cold, in the city and in the middle of a desert, in the mountains and over the sea. And the technical solutions that have been implemented into this machine allow it to withstand both comfy voyages and flights in aggressive conditions. The aviators were not wasting any time. The first operator came along already in the year 2000, after the official announcement of the AW139 program. It was the British Bristol Helicopters. That same year, the collaboration between the Italians and the British got to an entirely new level. Their joint company, EHI, which worked on the EH-101 helicopter, became the foundation for the merger of its owners, and the industry had seen the birth of the joint Augusta Westland. The prototype of the AW-139 was assembled and made its maiden flight as early as 2001, at the Vergiate airfield in northern Italy. Soon after, two additional prototypes joined the test flights. The serial helicopters began flying in summer of 2002. A year later, the AW-139 received its European type certificate, and in 2004 it got certified in the United States. In 2005, the aviators from both sides of the Atlantic took separate routes on the AW-139 program. The European Corporation bought out the share of Bell in the joint venture, and became the sole owner of the rights for the project. The guys in Bell thought that the commercial prospects of this helicopter were doubtful. The same happened a few years later with the BA-609. The Americans focused all their attention on the V-22 Osprey and the V-280 Valor, so they reduced their participation in the civilian program. Therefore now, the AW609 project is being carried out by Leonardo. Despite the skepticism shown by a series of experts, reality has proven the success of the risky concept. Its dimensions and flight performance made up a unique helicopter, and its versatility increased the demand. In this particular market segment, it barely had any direct competitors. Considering that the price per unit runs at about 15 million euros, sales volumes were huge. Besides, it served as a base for other models of Leonardo. Additionally, its expansion is maintained not only by the machines that fly all over the world, but also by the extension of production. In 2007, they arrived in the US and opened a factory in Philadelphia, which became the second assembly line for the AW139. After that, in 2008, the Italians signed an agreement with the Russian Helicopters Corporation and established the Halibert Company, not far from Moscow. The sales of Leonardo helicopters in Russia are handled by the X-Classes group. One may ask, why is there such a passion for this particular model in Russia? Well, Russia is a northern country, and unlike most helicopters of its class, the AW139 has a very important option for this region, the ice protection system. At first glance, this may not seem like a big deal. After all, such a system won't surprise anyone these days. But one thing is an airliner or a heavy helicopter, and it is a different story with the smaller machines. This system in itself is complicated, and what's worse, it is heavy. Several hundred kilos is a normal weight for it. The installation of the ice protection hinders the flight performance of medium helicopters, and can even make the light ones completely useless, as they won't be capable of moving anything else but themselves. But the versatility requirements laid down on the 139 were strict. It had to fly into the mountains and in cold regions. Flying without such a system to an oil rig somewhere in the northern sea is at least an extreme sport. Leonardo put all their efforts to optimize this system and make it lighter. As a result, they ended up at the 180 kg or 400 pounds mark, which is quite a modest number for its specifications. The system turns on the heating of the main and tail rotors, as well as the air intakes and cockpit windshield. Well, now let's take a look at the fiery heart of our hero. What we have here is the PT6C67C turboshaft engine, the brainchild of Pratt Whitney. The AW139 is a twin-engine helicopter, so it has two of those beauties. The strife of the engineers to make a versatile and robust helicopter can be seen here as well. While the airframe is built with quite a strength redundancy, the power plant has a considerable power reserve. 
Each of these engines generates 1679 horsepower during takeoff and can reach up to 1872 horsepower at full capacity. Such power gives the 139 the highest thrust to weight ratio in its class and its engines are capable of getting out of any ordeal. In fact, the 139 has the Class A safety certificate, which means that even if one of the engines fails during takeoff, this machine can continue climbing. In such a situation, most of the competitors would need to land immediately or might just fall down. And that comes aside from the basic safety features, redundant critical systems and the overall reliability of the power plant. During its certification, the helicopter was put to some quite brutal tests. For instance, while testing the engines and the transmission, it would fly dry, without any oil for an entire hour, which is twice as much as the safety authorities require. The overspendings to achieve this extra power are dealt with by implementing the usual technical and economic measures. The power plant is optimized for maintenance as much as possible and is equipped with all the cutting-edge elements and automation. In terms of economy, the costs are reduced by production scaling. The turboshaft Pratt Whitney PT6C engine is based on the turboprop PT6, which is one of the most popular engines in the world. The countless Beechcrafts, Cessnas, Embraers, Pipers, Pilatuses and other planes and helicopters are powered precisely by this engine. Such popularity allows to reduce its price, whilst the more developed infrastructure simplifies and reduces the maintenance costs. Besides, this extra power allowed Leonardo engineers to play around with weights. Apart from the base model, weighing 6.4 tons, they also offered heavier options, weighing 6.8 tons and 7 tons, without the need for deep modifications or performance loss. The military also got their machine. Considering the potential put into this helicopter, creating the AW-139M was not that hard. They just added some armor, reinforced some elements, installed special equipment and weapons. In addition to that, the US armed forces took a liking to the military version. To satisfy their needs, the local MH-139 version was created jointly with Boeing. And even with such an amount of modifications, the potential has not yet been depleted. It was decided to use this machine as the base for an entire family, which now includes the AW-169 and AW-189. But don't get misled by those names. The 169 is the lighter brother in the family, with takeoff weights ranging between 4.6 tons and 4.8 tons. The 189, on the other hand, is the heaviest, with weights ranging between 8.3 and 8.6 tons. Besides, the 189 has a military version, the AW149. Meanwhile, the family ties are preserved. These helicopters share lots of components, and at times it may even be hard to tell them apart. Okay, now that we are acquainted with the relatives, it's time to get back to our protagonist. Let's start with the tail. The four-bladed tail rotor is placed on the tail boom, just above the horizontal stabilizer. Placed quite high, this is where you start realizing the real dimensions of the apparently small helicopter. The main rotor has five blades on a full-grown hinge fixing with elastomatic bearings. Though it is quite a classic configuration for large helicopters, it looks like an engineering marvel. Leonardo is considered one of the world leaders in the field of power plant mechanization and transmissions. For instance, within the manufacturing chain of one of the main European military helicopters, the NH-90, jointly developed by Airbus, Leonardo and Fokker, the Italians are in charge of the hydraulic systems, the power plant and, foremost, the transmission. The major part of this beauty is usually hidden away from prying eyes, but I did get a chance to take a look. Luckily the fairing can be removed as easily as opening the hood of a car. At first, it may seem like five blades is too much for such a helicopter, so I think it's time to get to know the flight performance. The AW-139 has a high cruise speed. Very high. Not every military helicopter can keep up with it. The problem is that at high speeds, the lift force of the blades becomes unstable and their tips start breaking the sound barrier, so there is a risk of getting an extremely noisy and a bit crazy machine. Here, the blades are a bit wider, but shorter. The diameter of the main rotor blade is 13.8 meters, which is not all that much for such a big and heavy helicopter. But, thanks to this design, coupled with well-developed aerodynamics, composite materials and advanced tips, the engineers managed to provide the required performance and, at the same time, reduce the rotation speed. 
the AW139 can reach heights of over 6000 meters and maintain a cruise speed of 165 knots with a maximum speed of 167 knots. This machine can fly non-stop for more than 5 hours and has a range of 573 miles, while the maritime versions can fly even longer and farther, almost 6 hours and 675 miles. Obviously, such a massive main rotor shows its worth not only at high speeds, but also during takeoff and landings. The wind it creates around is very, very strong. How is it all controlled? To be honest, after seeing the cockpits of many light helicopters and even airplanes, the AW139 cockpit seems to be quite complex. On the other hand, you immediately realize that you are not inside the cockpit of a flying toy, but rather a serious flying machine. All this considering the really high level of automation, the helicopter can be piloted by just one person. The core of the interface and flight instruments is the Honeywell Primus Epic, a system for the grown-ups. Nowadays, Primus Epic is one of the most popular flight control systems, although it is mostly found on regional and business aviation. It is used in the business just by Cessna, Hawker and Dassault. The Apex used in the PC-12, Ace found in the PC-24 and the new plane view installed on the latest Gulfstreams are in fact deep modifications of the Primus Epic. It is even applied on the big, regional Embraer E-Jet. This brings along yet another bonus of unification. The popularity of these systems lowers the cost of not only manufacturing, but also maintenance and training. AW139 is fully equipped with lots of systems, some of which are more usually seen on airplanes. Meanwhile, the number of options is huge, which allows to easily customize the helicopter according to the presented needs. In fact, the flight control system is the best illustration of its versatility. The thing here is not that the AW139 is extremely versatile by itself, but that it is an excellent platform for customization. It can be not just a VIP, rescue, paramedic, police or an offshore helicopter. Each of those variants has a lot of additional options that allow to adapt this machine to specific requirements. What effect did it have on the sales? By the early 2010s it became clear just how good the AW139 turned out to be. Leonardo got a real game changer that allowed the already large consortium to bolster its positions all over the world. Apart from the localization of the 139 manufacturing in the US and Russia, Leonardo has also established quite a wide cooperation with suppliers from the US, Canada, UK, Turkey, Japan and other countries. Finally, we reached the part of the helicopter that probably everyone was waiting to see. We are, after all, inside the luxury flying machine with a 15 million euro price tag. But we're not going inside right away. First, we'll take a closer look at this part of the aircraft. A lot of work was put into it. Since it's a rather large helicopter, something had to be done to make it easier to access. The floor of the 139 is as even and low as possible, which required a change in the fuel system. The fuel tanks are installed not under the floor, but in the rear section of the fuselage, right behind the cabin. Even this does not make it as low as the car, so there is a footstep on each side. In the base version it is a simple fixed footstep, but there is an optional one that retracts automatically. This increases the aerodynamics, aesthetics and of course the price. The upper part also had to be worked on. The power plant of the helicopter is structurally isolated from the cabin. This allows to reduce the engine and transmission noise and adds up to the safety. In case of an emergency landing, all the equipment should not fall on the heads of the passengers. As a bonus, such solutions allow to have a geometrically simple space, which makes it easier to create different cabin configurations and easily change them if needed. There are lots of configurations and their main difference is the capacity. For instance, the basic passenger version can fit up to 15 people. The police version can take in up to 10 fully equipped and armed agents. The rescue and medical versions have the space for a crew of 5 and 4 stretchers. All this not counting the two pilots. And finally, the VIP version has room for 5 to 8 passengers. Let's take a closer look at it. We have the chance to inspect several machines. The first one has one of the classic VIP configurations for 8 passengers with 3 rows of seats. Four in the back, two in the center and another two backing the cockpit, separated by a wall and a glass door. Just like in a limo, with all the additional equipment. 
Obviously, Italy is Italy, and the guys from Leonardo were not going to fall short on the design, so they partnered with many European fashion companies. Hence, the VIP versions of the 139, with cabins from Versace or Karl Lagerfeld, are nothing out of the ordinary. Each cabin is handmade, which guarantees top quality and makes possible even deeper customization, including the design, materials, configurations, furniture, multimedia, satellite communications. You can even get a fridge installed in here. Therefore, the concept of a standard cabin is quite figurative, because almost all of them are exclusive and can differ in small details or have nothing in common. The price of the VIP cabins is counted in millions of euros, so in the end, given such possibilities, they are limited only by fantasy and the number of digits on the customer's bank account. The creators of the 139, especially of its VIP version, have paid huge attention to the fight against noise and vibrations, the eternal issues of any helicopter. In many cases, their noise level makes it impossible to talk inside the cabin, making it necessary to wear special headsets. Here, of course, you can also find them. The classic Bose A20, known by many aviators, comfy and reliable. But come on, Leonardo, with such a price tag, you gotta do better. Many of the solutions consist in passive noise suppression. The isolation of the power plant, multi-layered glazing, soundproof materials. Besides, the helicopter can be optionally equipped with sliding or swing doors. For the usual versions, the sliding doors are preferable, whilst the VIP versions are equipped specifically with the swing doors. The downside of such doors is their dimensions and weight. They are really hefty and thick. On the other hand, they are much more effective in terms of noise suppression. But the story does not end there. The helicopter is also equipped with active noise and vibration reduction instruments. The obvious source of the problem, the engine and the transmission, are right above our heads. In order to suppress the vibrations, a special mechanism is installed there, to work an anti-phase to the engine's oscillations, which cancels the vibrations. In addition to that, inside the walls and floor of the cabin, there are special blocks with mechanics that also suppress vibrations. Of course, this is not a completely new technology. For instance, Bombardier has implemented something similar into the new generation of Q-series turboprops. In fact, this is where the name comes from, the Quiet series. But for a helicopter, this is a very awesome bonus. Coupled with the overall sound isolation, it provides a high level of comfort inside the cabin. You can't make a recording studio out of it, but you will not experience any problems while resting or chatting, almost like in a commercial airplane. The cargo compartment of the helicopter is found in the rear of the fuselage and can be accessed through a hatch on the side. The internal volume of this compartment is 3.4 cubic meters, but considering the thrust-to-weight ratio of this machine, it would be silly not to include the possibility of hauling cargo on a cargo hook. So you can do it here as well. The AW139 sits on a tricycle-wheeled landing gear with a rotary front leg. Of course, this is a more complicated configuration than that of the usual skids, but it simplifies the operation on the ground. Besides, it is much more comfortable to land on wheels with their effective suspension. Since this thing has a completely wild cruise speed for a helicopter, the aerodynamics also play an important role here. Therefore, the landing gear is retractable. The front leg is hidden inside the fuselage, while the main gears go into their small external fairings. It did not take long for the AW139 to gain popularity, which it still enjoys nowadays. These helicopters are loved by clients from all over the world, from private owners to corporations and governments. Its ability to work in cold environments has paid off yet again. The largest operator of these machines is the Canadian CHC Helicopters, which has a fleet of over 40 AW139s. But this record might not last too long. The military version, the MH-139, has won the tender of the US Air Force, so if everything goes as planned by Leonardo and Boeing, in the early 2020s Uncle Sam will buy 84 units. Overall, the AW-139 is operated by state and military agencies of over 20 countries, and there are even more commercial customers. By 2013, over 720 machines were used by 200 operators in 60 countries. And by the autumn of 2019, the number of delivered helicopters surpassed 1,000 units. The story of the rotary wing brainchild of Leonardo continues to develop as it gets more and more new models, features and chapters. 
The Leonardo AW-139 is an important character in the big aviation history, and we will be keeping track of it. Big thanks to the guys from the Gorka heliport, to Skypro and X-Classes for the access granted to the helicopters. And of course to Leonardo for manufacturing these beauties. I think we can end our today's story here. Like and subscribe to the channel. Luxurious flights and soft landings to you.